chapter 3. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. And, and that is going to be um, our text for the next several weeks. Um, we're starting a new sermon series today. Uh, this is a sermon series about the Word of God. And for the next uh, six weeks, we're going to be talking about 2 Timothy 3, 15 through 17. Now, just a little disclaimer, I promise you, I'm not going to bore you by sticking just to this text for six weeks. Uh, we're going to use this as the background for the series. Uh, and, and we're going to be all over the Bible. Uh, talking about what the Bible says about itself, the biblical witness to biblical revelation. So if you're one who enjoys taking notes, uh, keep your pencils handy because we are going to be all over the scriptures um, in, this, in the next couple weeks. Now a little bit of background about 2 Timothy. Um, this is Paul's second letter to Timothy. And when we read the, uh, the book of Acts and we read the historical account of, of Paul's missionary journeys, Timothy was his closest understudy. Timothy was his student. Timothy was the one who Paul really poured himself into as a minister uh, and was really expecting Timothy to carry on the gospel after, after Paul would leave, after Paul would die. Uh, and in fact, 2 Timothy is the last of the Pauline epistles that we have in the canon of Scripture. It's the last letter that Paul wrote. Uh, and we see language towards the end of, of 2 Timothy that uh, let us know that Paul knew he was dying. He knew he didn't have much time left. We find that, that great passage in chapter 4 where Paul says, I have finished the fight. I have I finished the good race. I fought the good fight. And there is now in store for me a crown of righteousness that God promises to those who love Him. Paul knew that his life was coming to an end. And he wrote this letter to his beloved Timothy, his understudy. And, and throughout the book, it's very personal. In chapter 3, what we see is Paul saying, Timothy, you know what? Men are going to be men. They're going to reject the gospel. They're going to pervert the scriptures. They're going to do things that they want to do. And then he offers some advice. And this is some timeless advice. And this is where we're going to, to kind of spend most of our time in the next couple of weeks. Uh, chapter 3, starting in verse 15, he talks to Timothy and he says, from childhood you have known the Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may, may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. See, Paul gives this, this passage to Timothy. He writes this letter to encourage him to, to be a good minister of the gospel. He says, men are going to reject you, but you, you stick to the Word. You've known it since your childhood. This, the Scriptures that are able to make you wise for salvation. And he gives this passage in, verse, in chapter 4, the very next thing that Paul says. He says, I charge you, Timothy, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at His appearing and His kingdom, preach the Word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. In other words, what Paul says, and this is something that is, is pounded into us as ministers of the Gospel, even today, preach the Word. Preach the Word. Woe be it to any minister or any one of us who would go and preach something other than the message that comes out from the Word of God Himself. That's what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, we're going to be talking about the Scriptures for the next several weeks. And we're talking about this bold statement that we have. In it we find the purpose of the Bible. That's what we're going to talk about today. Look what it says in verse 15. It says, The Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. We're going to talk about that truth in depth today. But another thing we learn from this text, it reveals the author of the Bible. All Scripture is given under inspiration of God. We're going to talk about that a little bit more in depth next week. In this text... Paul reveals to us through inspiration of the Holy Spirit the function of the Bible, what the Bible does. It's profitable for doctrine, for the teachings of the church. They come from the God-breathed Scriptures. They don't come from man. It's the Word of God that provides the foundation for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, instruction in righteousness. And lastly, when we look at what Paul writes here in verse 17, 
It reveals the results of one who submits to biblical authority. That when you surrender your life to the fact that this is God's Word and you live out the truths contained in the pages of Scripture, you will be made complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work that God equips us through His Word. So those are the things that we're going to be studying through this series. Um, and it's my hope that we think through why we believe what we believe. I think all of us, as, especially as Baptists, hold a particularly high view of Scripture, that this is the Word of God. Yet unfortunately, I think so many of us, when confronted or when somebody has a question about something that may be a sticky issue of today, we simply say, well, God says it. I believe it. That settles it. And there's a lot of truth to that. And, and, and I would applaud you for your conviction in holding to God's truth. But my hope is that through this series and through the next six weeks, we think through why we believe this is the Word of God. Why God says it. So we can articulate the Gospel. We need to be better equipped to be able to share the Word of God, understanding why we believe what we believe and not simply being indoctrinated by some preacher somewhere. So that's my challenge for each and every one of us here today. Is over the course of the next six weeks, let's think through why we believe what we believe about the Word of God. Let's pray together. Father, what a precious and great gift Your Word is to us. Lord, I thank You for, for giving us these Scriptures today. For giving us Your Word. For making it alive. For living an abiding Word as Peter tells us. Lord, I pray, Holy Spirit, that You would be in our hearts. Holy Spirit, we thank You for divinely inspiring different men at different times throughout history to record Your words. And Holy Spirit, we pray that You would be on our hearts today. Open our, our minds and our hearts that we might be able to understand the Scriptures that You've inspired. Above all, we thank You for Jesus Christ. God in the flesh revealed through these Scriptures. God, we thank You for Jesus, His work on the cross. His saving us. to debt that we can never repay. Lord, we love You. We thank You. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Folks, for today, we're going to take a look at 2 Timothy 3.15. That's going to be the basis of our text today. We're going to talk about what is the purpose of the Scriptures? What is the purpose of the Scriptures? A chapter 3 starting in verse 15 says this, From childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Folks, the first thing I want us to know about our Bibles today, first thing I want us to point out is simply this. Your Bible is a collection of Holy Scriptures. Your Bible is a collection of Holy Scriptures. When you look at your Bible, you open up your Bible, they may have an introduction, there may be some notes, there may be some footnotes, you may have a concordance, you may have maps. There's all sorts of things in your Bible. But the meat of the Bible is indeed the Word of God. What Paul refers to here as Holy Scriptures. Holy Scriptures literally means sacred writings. Your Bible, when you open it up, it is the Word of God. And it contains 66 individual books or sacred writings. Sacred because they're inspired by God Himself. They're not authored by humans. God chose certain men at certain times and use them to pen down for all eternity and preserve His Word. But the Scriptures that we have, our Bible is filled with sacred writings. If you were to turn in your Bibles to, to Hebrews, the very beginning, the author of Hebrews says this. This is chapter 1, verse 1. God, who at various times and various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by His Son. God has always been in the business of speaking, hasn't He? When we read the Bible all the way back to Genesis, we see God speaking. Genesis 1.1, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was void and, and formless. And the Holy Spirit hovered above the face of the deep. And in verse 3, what happened? Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. God spoke. He's always been in the business of speaking. The Bible records things that God says as He reveals Himself to us. 
At different times, at various times, in various ways, God has spoken through the prophets first. Now that's not simply the prophets that are listed as authors in our Bible, like Jonah, like Nahum, and Obadiah, and Daniel, and Ezekiel. It's not simply those, but it's prophets that don't necessarily have books named after them. Prophets like Elijah and Elisha, like Miriam. Prophets all throughout biblical history. God has spoken through different people at different times in particular circumstances. We need to understand that about our Bible. That it is a collection of sacred writings. The second thing I think when we read 2 Timothy 3.15 that we find out is your Bible is a collection of holy scriptures that has the power to change you. Did you think about that? These sacred writings have the power to change you. 2 Timothy 3.15, going back to it, says, You have known the Holy Scriptures which are able to do something. The Scriptures have power because they're God's words. They're not men's words. They're able to do something, aren't they? They have power. The Word of God that we have today in our Bibles is a living and abiding Word. It's not an inactive, dormant word. It's active. It has power to do something. God uses the Bible to do a multitude of things. Not the least of which is to convict us of sin. One of the things that the Bible does is it convicts us of sin. God has laid out in clear, unmistakable terms exactly what is sin and what is not. We find that in His Word. If we were left without God's Word, we wouldn't know exactly what is pleasing to God and what isn't. We'd have a good idea. We'd have a general idea, but we wouldn't specifically know. Through the Bible, God convicts us of sin because He tells us in His Word what is pleasing to Him and what is displeasing to Him. What brings Him honor and glory and what He won't show His face to. He convicts us of sin. Another thing that God does through His Bible and how God uses the Scriptures is to correct us and to instruct us. God doesn't simply say and point out to us our flaws. He says, you know what? I can fix this. This is what you need to do to become whole. We know as Christians from the New Testament that's through faith in Jesus Christ. We know that that's how we're cleansed from our, from our sin. But even in, in the time of Israel, God always provided a way for His people to be restored from sin through purity rituals, through sacrifice. God has always had a way. He corrects and instructs us. And apart from His Word, we wouldn't know how to do that, would we? So we praise God and thank Him for His Word that we can be the people He's called us to be. God also comforts and guides us through His Word. How many times when we experience serious loss, serious tragedy, do we find ourselves in the Word of God? Reading things like, He is my refuge and my strength, an ever-present help in a time of need. Or we read things like, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. God uses His Word to provide us comfort and guidance when we need it the most. God's Word is a collection of holy scriptures that has the power to change you because He ministers to you through the Word. This brings us to the last thing I want to talk about today. The fact that your Bible is a collection of holy scriptures that has the power to change you because your Bible testifies about Jesus Christ. From beginning to end, from the very first cha chapters of Genesis to the very end of Revelation, the biblical witness is about Jesus the Christ, the Son of God. We see that all over the Bibles. Jesus Himself expressly said this in, in John chapter 5, verse 39, when Jesus was speaking to the religious leaders of the day and confronting the Pharisees. He says, You search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me. What a wonderful way for us today to look at the Old Testament. Through the fact and, and, and enlightened by the fact that Christ has come as Savior of the world. We see Christ in the Old Testament when we look for Him. Now I'll give you this, sometimes it's much easier than others. You'd be hard-pressed to read Judges chapter 19 about the concubine who ran away and then the, the man who offered his concubine up for 
terrible things, cut her up into pieces and sent her out. You'd be hard pressed to find Christ in Judges chapter 19. What scholars call the sewer of the Scriptures. But flip it to Judges chapter 20 and you'll see how God restores His people. You see what happens in three days. You see what God does and how He restores the nation of Israel. We see Christ in the Old Testament when we look for Him. Because He's there. We see it all the way back in Genesis. If you were to turn into Genesis chapter 3, what you'd see is you'd see the fall of man. You'd see God's people, Adam and Eve, rebelling against God, doing things that God forbade them to do. And what happens? They listen to the serpent, right? The serpent convinces them that it's okay. Adam and Eve, they sin, they fall. There's consequences to that. The first thing that God does, and this is Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, He says, I will put enmity which is opposition between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. In other words, what God says when we translate that is, there will be a time, Satan, when I'm going to send a Savior to this world that's going to stomp on your head. You may nip at his heels, but he's going to crush your head. Once and for all, there will be a Savior. We know that Savior has come in the form of Jesus Christ. He's going to come again and He's going to usher that in once and for all. But look at this even further because I think we miss this. If we look for Christ, we can see Him even in the curse of man. When man fell, when Adam and Eve fell and they betrayed God, God said to the woman, this is verse, chapter 3, verse 16 of Genesis, I will greatly multiply your sorrow in conception, and pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. In verse 17, God then said to Adam, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread. Folks, I want you to think about this. Because if we didn't know Christ and we didn't know the events of His life, His birth, His life, His death, and His resurrection, this wouldn't make any sense to us how this could be about Jesus. But I want you to think about this. How did Jesus come into this world? through childbirth. He came, God in the flesh came through childbirth, through this very curse on woman. When Christ died and He hung on that cross, what did He wear on His head? A crown of thorns. By the thorns in the sweat of His brow. When we look for Christ in the Old Testament, we can find Him. We find Him everywhere. He's there because the Scriptures testify to Him just like He said. I want to close with this story. I want to close with the fact, uh, and, and some of you know this uh, of me, before I came here as a youth minister, one of the things I got to do was I got to be a chaplain for a high school football team. Great job. Great gig that was. I had no responsibilities to coach. I could show up to practice if I wanted to. I didn't have to. Um, I always could pray with the kids. was welcome to do that. The coach was wonderful. Gave me great access to the kids. But my biggest responsibility was on game day. On game day, right before the high school varsity football team would take the field, I'd have about 10 minutes to share a devotion with them in the locker room before they took the field. Wonderful opportunity. And I'll never forget the very first time I was doing it. I was nervous. I didn't know what I was going to say to these kids. I didn't know them. Uh, it was brand new to me. I was brand new into the ministry. I said, man, what am I going to do with these kids? So, you know, of course, I spent some time introducing myself, telling them my background, who I was, and all that. And I said, you know what, kids? I want to read you something. And I want you to tell me who this passage of Scripture is about. So I stood up in the locker room before them, and I read this. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shoes is silent, so he opened not his mouth. I read that passage of Scripture and I asked those 
that football team, I said, who's this passage of Scripture about? And all of them instantly, well, that's about Jesus. I said, you're absolutely right, it is about Jesus. I said, do you know what book of the Bible it is? So, of course, we were still trying to get to know each other, so they were somewhat shy. I said, I'll tell you what. I took a $5 bill out of my pocket and I held it up. I said, I got $5 for somebody who can tell me what book of the Bible this comes out of. Well, $5 is enough to bribe a high school kid. I mean, they started shouting out some answers. Um, you know, they said, it's John, it's Mark, it's Galatians, it's this, it's that. And none of them got it right. I said, folks, you know this is about Jesus Christ, right? And they said, yeah, you have no doubts about that, right? I said, no, no doubts. I said, this was written 700 years before Christ walked the face of the earth. And their jaws dropped. They're like, what? I said, this is Isaiah. This is Isaiah chapter 53. This is the suffering servant. And I use that as a platform to tell those kids, this is who I am. I'm a Bible preacher. I believe this to be the Word of God with all my heart. And I will do nothing short but proclaim the message from this. I made a commitment to them. I make a commitment to each and every one of you. This is the Word of God and this is the foundation of each preaching ministry that I've got. We ought to make a commitment as a church to say this is the Word of God and this is the foundation for every ministry that we've got. An outreach ministry. A Sunday school teaching ministry. Everything we say, everything we do, when we proclaim a message, that message needs to come from here, not here. It needs to be God's message. I know you know what? Let me take back what I just said. It does need to come from here. Because this needs to be dwelt in here. But it's not my message that I preach. It's His message. We find His truth. We become convicted by His truth and His Word as He's giving it to us. And we share His message with this lost and dying world. Will you make that commitment today? Folks, there's, there's some of us here. We're going to have a time of commitment. Time of response, a hymn of invitation. Al's going to come up and he's going to lead us in singing this song. And I ask you, church, will you commit anew to the Word of God and living out what God has for your life? It has the power to transform you. God wants to use His Word to shape you into exactly who He wants you to be. What is the purpose of the Bible? The purpose of the Bible is to point us to Jesus Christ. To make us wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. That's what this is about. It's about pointing us to a right relationship with God through faith in His Son. The Old Testament prepared the way. The New Testament tells us exactly how to do it. Faith in the one true King, Jesus Christ. Will you live that out as a New Testament church? And church members, I ask you to commit to that today. Maybe you need to do that up here and you need to pray about that up at the altar. And if you do, that's fine. The altar is open. You can do that in your seats. Folks, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as Lord of your life, let me tell you something. This Bible tells us exactly how to do that. It starts by recognizing that we need a Savior. It starts by recognizing the fact that we're not perfect, that we sin and we fall short of the glory of God. We're not the people that God wants us to be without Him in our life. And the only way we can get rid of sin is to confess faith in the Son of God, the incarnate Word, Jesus Christ. If God has put that on your heart today to surrender your life to Him, come forward, let me pray with you about that. Tell you how you can become a Christian, how this Bible can transform your heart because it's the Word of God and it's how He speaks to us. Maybe you have to make a decision that has nothing to do with what I preached about today. But if you have a decision to make, if the Holy Spirit has put something on your heart, I would urge you to respond to it. Whatever it may be, wherever it may be. Will you respond to the Word of God? Let's pray together. Father, what a precious gift You've given us through Your Word. Lord, I pray as a church that we would understand and we would be committed to being a biblical people. That God, we would open our hearts to hear Your message. To heed Your words. To be the people that You've called us to be. God, I pray through Your Holy Spirit that You would illumine our minds to be able to understand every word in, these, in this Bible. 
that we might have the conviction and courage and wisdom to be able to share your word with others. God, we trust that you do that because you're faithful to your word. You tell us through your prophets that your word will never return to you void, that it will accomplish that which you've sent out for it to do. God, we know that you've sent out your word to reach the lost. And God, I pray that you help us to use your word to reach the lost right here in Rocky Ford. To reach the lost that we come in contact with. That we might share you by knowing you better through your word. God, we love you. We thank you. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.